Welcome to episode two of the Cheese Steaks and Controllers podcast for Fox PHL The Gambler. I am the esports insider Jason Finelli, and we have a terrific show for you this evening. We're going to deep dive into another esports league to give you all the information you need to enjoy watching over the weekends. We have our first ever cheese steaks and controllers interview segment which is very exciting plus all of the other news and games that are coming out that you would expect so let's not waste any more time and go into the six in 60 seconds The Philadelphia Fusion won their Overwatch League match this weekend, beating the Houston Outlaws three games to zero. The Boston Uprising are up next this coming Sunday at 3 p.m. Elsewhere, the Florida Mutineers won the Call of Duty League home series beating the top three teams in the league on the way to the win. The Paris Legion home series for the Call of Duty League is this weekend. The 76ers Gaming Club won their first two games of the year, but it was not enough to move on in the NBA 2K League tip-off event. Elsewhere, EA showed off their latest games in EA Play 2020 presentation, including gameplay for Star Wars Squadrons, Apex Legends coming to Switch, and Madden 21 and FIFA 21 gameplay. Meanwhile, Pokemon Presents presented the latest and greatest in Pokemon, including new information on the Isle of Armor expansion for Pokemon's Sword and Shield, and a brand new Pokemon Snap game. Finally, Fortnite's Season 3 for Chapter 2 has launched, flooding the map and adding Jason Momoa's Aquaman in the process. That is your six in 60 seconds. Always a lot to talk about in this industry, especially this time of year. Uh, I expect that the six in 60 seconds will be filled to the brim with things to talk about for a long, long time. Uh, I am going to get into EA Play a little bit later on in the speed run. Uh, I want to get a little more in-depth as to what was announced and what wasn't. Um, But for now... We talk a lot when I'm on with Sean Brace about the Overwatch League and the Philadelphia Fusion, which makes sense. Uh, Went over that last episode. If you haven't heard it already, I deep dive the entire Overwatch League in the first episode. Go listen to that. Um, This week, I want to talk about another league that that is frequently brought up in my discussions with Sean Brace, and that is the Call of Duty League. Now, Call of Duty League has been around a long time under a different name. The Call of Duty World League uh, was there for a while, and we'll get into that in a little while. But um, now, starting in the year 2020, they have morphed into the Call of Duty League, uh, which will explain the entire league and how it's and how it's formatted right now. But first and foremost, for those of you who don't play games but are listening to this podcast to maybe get more informed... The simple question is, what is Call of Duty? It's a strange question to hear for the seasoned gamer. People who have listened to games for a long time that are listening to this, like, duh, everybody knows what Call of Duty is. But if we're going to get into the actual meat and potatoes of the Call of Duty League, we first have to understand what Call of Duty is. So for those that don't know, Call of Duty is one of the most successful video game franchises ever made. Hands down, sells millions of copies every single year when a new iteration comes out. It is a first-person military shooter that features full-story campaigns and a breadth of online multiplayer modes from competitive modes, cooperative modes, to the Battle Royale scene that has taken 
uh, the world by storm in games like Fortnite and Player Unknown's Battlegrounds. It is published by Activision, who has been making games for a very, very long time. And they are worked on and developed by multiple teams within Activision, including Infinity Ward, most famous for the Modern Warfare series, Treyarch, most famous for the Black Ops series of games, Sledgehammer Games, which worked on Advanced Warfare uh, before taking a more supporting role, and a few other studios like Beanox does things behind the scenes. Um, this game is less about superhero characters. It is not like Overwatch in that these are over-the-top superheroes, massive, uh, unworldly powers. These are soldiers. They are bred, they are made, excuse me, to be as realistic as possible uh, in the way they look, the way they dress, the way they uh, hold themselves. It's supposed to be a military style shooter, a little more grounded in reality than Overwatch is. Uh, we're not talking about powers, we're talking about loadouts, so specific types of guns with certain attachments, uh, different equipment that they can bring into the field, perks that are used uh, to give their character a little bit, little boosts throughout a match, things like that. We're not, Overwatch, if Overwatch is Saturday morning cartoons, Call of Duty is Saving Private Ryan. That's an easy and very, very, very uh, loose way of putting it, uh, but it's, it's, it's a good way to determine the difference between the two. Granted, in Call of Duty, um, it's not terribly violent, other than a spray of blood um, when a character dies. Uh, it's not, like, the, like, in this particular game that they're playing now, characters aren't having their limbs blown apart, they're not being like blown into pieces when a grenade goes off, nothing like that. It is, it is. They just kind of get shot and fall over and die, or the the grenade blows up near them and they fly, but they don't. They stay intact, so it's not completely realistic, which is probably a good thing. But it's a little more grounded in reality than Overwatch is. So because we're focusing on the Call of Duty League, we're going to be focusing, of course, on competitive Call of Duty. In Call of Duty League, two teams of five players face each other in a best-of-five series, with each game in the series playing one of three formats. So there are five matches that follow a specific order of format. Every match follows the same order. So if you hear that they're in Game 3, you know they're going to be playing a certain mode. If you hear that they're in Game 2, they're going to be playing this one. Um, those three modes are, first... Hard point. Hard point is where two teams fight over control of a single area on a map in a five minute match. Now, that five minutes sounds low, but there's some clock manipulation that goes on during a match, which I will explain here. When a team claims the hard point for themselves, they earn one point for every second that they claim it, and the clock, the five minute timer, freezes, does not move. If an opposing team's player enters the area after it's been claimed, scoring stops, the, the claimed team no longer gets one point per second, and the hard point becomes contested, which restarts the five-minute clock. After a hard point is active for one minute, regardless of scoring, it moves to another location. So the hard point is not static. It does move around a map, and the clock is manipulated based on whether a team controls it or it's being contested. That is a lot to take in. It sounds confusing, but in action, it is actually quite easy to follow. Uh, these matches go first to 250 points wins, so the first team to claim the hard points for a total of 250 seconds wins, or whoever has the most points when that five-minute clock reaches zero, wins the hard point round. Now, I have not seen, in my experience watching Call of Duty League, the hard point clock deplete the five minutes. If it's happened, I've missed that match. So it does not happen often. You will see 250 before you see the five-minute clock go down to zero. Um, this is a very fun mode to watch. It's very interesting to see the different strategies that teams employ, especially when a hard point is about to move. 
a lot of times you'll see a team entrenched in the current hard point. They make their stand, they get their points, and then after the minute is up and the hard point moves, the team that was on the outside is now already in position at the new hard point, and they immediately claim it and start scoring. So there's a lot of seesaw back and forth in a hard point match that is really cool. It's really interesting to watch. Um, these hard point matches are always games one and four in a five game series. So if you hear game one or game four, it's going to be hard point. Domination is the second mode. This one is a little more frenetic, a little more frantic, a little more fast paced. Uh, in domination, teams battle over control of three designated points on a map. These points do not move. They stay the same, lettered A, B, and C. Claiming a point takes 10 seconds. So once a team gets to a point, it takes 10 seconds to claim it. And then once it's claimed, the counter starts where they earn one point every five seconds. So, for example, a team could be claiming, could have claimed two sections, A and B, where the other team has only claimed one, C. So every five seconds, the one team gets two points, the other team gets one point, as long as they control those uh, sections. Complete domination is when a team controls all three and the other team is fighting to get them back. That doesn't happen as often as you would think, but it does happen, and those situations are always, always fun to watch. There are two 10-minute rounds with a brief halftime in the middle. So you play 10 minutes, take a little break, you play another 10 minutes, and whoever has the highest score after that final 10 minutes, wins the domination round and earns a point in the series. Domination is always game three. Every single match, it's game three. So hard point, one and four. Domination, game three. Games two and five are a mode called search and destroy. This is the most strategic mode in Call of Duty League. This is where... The teams really shine, in my opinion. It's the most fun to watch mode of the three, particularly because it's game five, usually the deciding game. So in Search and Destroy, you have 90 second rounds. One team is on offense. One team is on defense. The offensive team's objective is to plant a bomb in one of two static designated areas on a map and the defensive team is trying to prevent it. However, when a player is killed, they're out of the round. There is no respawning, there is no returning in a search and destroy round. Once you lose, once you're eliminated, once you die, you're done until the next round resets. That is a huge factor. Because victory in a round is achieved either by Detonating the bomb, which takes 45 seconds after planning it. Defusing the bomb, which takes 10 seconds to defuse after it's been planted. Or eliminating the entire team. So you'll find that a lot of teams just focus on getting those quick kills in order to rack up round points, especially if they fall behind, instead of worrying about the bomb at all. There are two ways to really approach this. Sometimes... There could be a team who gets a lot of kills and then realizes, oh, I can plant the bomb to force the other, the remaining players out of hiding and then get them that way and win the round. Very, very fun cat and mouse style mode. I love Search and Destroy. It's fun to play. It's fun to watch. It's, it was whoever created it back in the day is a genius. It's just really, really cool. If you play Counter-Strike, it's very much Counter-Strike style gameplay. Um... The first team to win six rounds of Search and Destroy wins the game and gets the point in the series. So, if you hear round 11 in Search and Destroy, that means we're in the deciding round. If you hear game five, round 11, 
that means we're in the deciding round of the deciding game of the series. Game 5, round 11, is top Call of Duty League. So tense, so exciting, especially if a team that you're into is uh, playing in this game. Very, very cool. So, those are the formats that Competitive Call of Duty League follow. It's a lot. I understand that. But having this background makes it easier to really understand what's happening on the TV in front of you, um, particularly with the different modes and their different rule sets. Uh, If you just happen to be glancing on YouTube and you find a match and you click on it, uh, if they're fighting over one territory, it's hard point. If they're fighting over three territories, it's domination. Or if you see two designated territories, it's search and destroy. Easy way to gauge what mode they're in, and also how far into the series they're in, because games one and four are hard point, games two and five are search and destroy, and game three is domination. So that is competitive Call of Duty, particularly in a Call of Duty League format. There are other competitive modes in Call of Duty, obviously, like standard death matches and things like that. But these three modes are the modes that the League focuses on. Now let's turn our attention to the League itself. Call of Duty League is, as the name suggests, an esports league centered around Call of Duty. It normally follows the latest release of Call of Duty, which right now was the revamping of the Modern Warfare franchise. And the League is currently in its inaugural season as the Call of Duty League. As I mentioned before, previously it was called Call of Duty World League, and it featured the esports organizations themselves as teams, like last year's champion E-United, Optic Gaming, which you'll hear again in a second, Evil Geniuses, and other esports-specific organizations. The move to Call of Duty League from the Call of Duty World League also introduced the city-based system that the Overwatch League has employed for two years prior to this year. This makes sense for a couple of reasons. One, Activision and Blizzard are the same company. Activision makes Call of Duty, Blizzard makes Overwatch, so borrowing that format just makes perfect sense. And second, now you have the cities that can get behind their teams, as the Overwatch League has proven is possible, and you start to build your league a little more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A little more casually, a little more, uh, bring, you bring in the people who might not watch it otherwise, because now their city is involved. It's the Minnesota team, not just United, And that intrigues people. That brings people in. So 12 teams currently play in the Call of Duty League from four different countries. You have the United States, which has primarily, which has the most teams primarily. You have Canada, you have the United Kingdom, and you have France. Also, unlike the Overwatch League with its divisions and conferences, there is none of that here. These 12 teams are in one standings, ranked from 1 to 12, based on how many points they score in every weekend home series. Now, normally, every two weeks, eight of the 12 teams play in what's called a home series. Each team hosts a home series. It was originally intended to be a tournament held in that city. So, for example, this weekend is the Paris Legion home series. They would have been in Paris if not for the pandemic. Last weekend was the Minnesota series. They would have been in Minneapolis, St. Paul, so on and so forth. Um, Next year, they plan, hopefully, to get back into the city-based format. But for now, all the games are played online. These home series are double elimination tournaments that begin on Friday and end on Sunday. And points in the standings are up for grabs at each of these series. Teams are given 10 points in the standings for every game they win, regardless of how they do in the tournament. If they win one match, they get 10 points. If they win the entire thing, they get 10 points for every victory, plus 50 more for first place. Second place gets a 30-point bonus. Third and fourth place get 20 points each. 
Fifth and sixth places get 10 points bonus each. And seventh and eighth places get no additional points. Like the Overwatch League, all of these Call of Duty League matches happen one at a time on the League's YouTube channel whenever a home series is on. So anyone can watch any match on a given weekend without the games directly competing with one another, which is huge for a league like this, still in its beginning throws, so people can focus on each team individually and pick their favorites as the season progresses. Now, I did say normally these series are every two weeks, but um, this most recent one, the Minnesota Home Series, was originally scheduled for the first week of June. Uh, The league opted to delay their... Home, the Minnesota Home Series for a week due to the civil unrest that was happening in America at the time. So they kicked off this past weekend, meaning we now have two straight weekends of Call of Duty. This weekend, June 19th to the 21st, the Paris Legion Home Series will feature the Paris Legion, the Florida Mutineers, the London Royal Ravens, the Dallas Empire, the New York Subliners, Optic Gaming Los Angeles, which opted to name after the esports franchise, not give it an actual name. The Atlanta Phase and the Toronto Ultra. And then they take a couple of weeks off planned. These were already planned weeks off in the schedule. And then come back in July with three straight weekends of home series action. First, the New York Subliners home series, which will feature New York, Toronto, Paris, the Chicago Huntsman, London, the Los Angeles Gorillas, the Atlanta, and the Minnesota Rocker, R-O-K-K-R. It's a Viking term. The London Home Series, July 17th through 19th, will feature London, the Seattle Surge, Dallas, Paris, both L.A. teams, the Gorillas and Optic Gaming, New York and Florida. And then the final Home Series, the Toronto Ultra Home Series, will feature Toronto, Minnesota, Atlanta, Dallas, Florida, Seattle, Chicago, and Optic Gaming LA. Now, after those four home series play at the end of July, the final standings will dictate placement in the playoffs. All 12 teams are making the playoffs in this inaugural season. That was not supposed to be the case. It was only supposed to be the top eight would make the playoffs, but because of COVID, they have elected to open up the playoffs to all 12 teams with a catch. The playoff structure structure will be the same as the home series, double elimination, best of five matches. However, the first and second teams in the standings will receive two round buys. So they skip right to the third round. The third and fourth place teams receive a one round buy going to round two. The fifth to 8th place teams will start in the winner's bracket of round 1, and the ninth to 12th place teams will start in the loser's bracket of round 1. So, the 9 through 12 teams were not even supposed to be in the playoffs. Now they are, but they're one and done. If they lose, they're out. Which seems unfair to a point, but if it's have one chance or don't make the playoffs at all, I'm going to take the have one chance. That makes sense to me. So the playoffs don't have a date yet, but all of this action kicks off on the official Call of Duty League YouTube, youtube youtube.com slash official MLG COD. That's where you can find all the future live streams and on-demand versions of all the previous matches in case you want to get caught up. I would suggest watching the most recent home series finals, uh, Florida versus Atlanta, an excellent match that went the full five games, or was it four? Might have been four games. Uh, Florida took it three to one in the finals, but easily a very, very, very fun finals to watch. Atlanta is one of the top teams in the league, and Florida continues to prove itself to be worthy of the top five, even after playing the entire home series with a player who had never been on the team before, never had been in the league before, and this was his first home series ever. His name is Awakening, and he was phenomenal. The whole team was phenomenal in getting to the finals. 
Um, so that would be the first match I would recommend to you is Florida versus Atlanta from this past weekend, the Minnesota Home Series Finals. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is Call of Duty League. The format, the number of teams, who those teams are and where they're from. There is a considerable lack of the word Philadelphia in this description. I understand that. Being a Philadelphia-based podcast, I do have to acknowledge that there is not a Philadelphia team yet. Wink, wink. Nudge, nudge. Um, If the Overwatch League has proven anything, the way we filled the Met back in February, we would do just as well, if not better, with a Call of Duty League team. I will say that until they give one to me. Us, not just me, us, the city. Um, I'm not sure what Comcast Spectacore is waiting for. They own the Fusion. Why not get a franchise in the Call of Duty League if it's available? Call them the Philadelphia Liberty or the Philadelphia Revolution or something like that. That's what I would call them. But I don't make the rules. Um, So here's to hoping that Philadelphia will have a Call of Duty League team in the future. But until then, use this segment as your primer into how the league works and really enjoy it. Uh, Now, while you don't have a team in the race... Get familiar with it, enjoy the spectacle now, so that way when the team does come, you're ready to back them full force and become the ravenous Philadelphia sports fans that you are. That's what I plan on doing, and I hope that you'll join me in that voyage. However, before that, I hope you're thirsty, because now it's time to talk about what's on tap for this week. The big launch this week is Friday, June 19th, and The Last of Us Part 2, the follow-up to the critically acclaimed 2013 release, The Last of Us, a PlayStation 4 exclusive by Naughty Dog Entertainment. Um, The game has reviewed incredibly well, with a 95 out of 100 average score on Metacritic, so... Uh, If you are into good action-adventure games that tell a wonderful story, The Last of Us 2 is for you. Later on in the week, we have SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated, a revamp of the acclaimed 2003 game SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom, the exact opposite of The Last of Us Part 2. This is an action platformer starring Spongebob and his friends getting into those wacky hijinks that they do. And then finally, on the 24th, we have Ninjala, a free-to-play multiplayer action game by Gung Ho Online Entertainment for the Nintendo Switch. This is a multiplayer action game where players use ninjas that harness the power of bubblegum to fight each other. It's hard to explain, but man, it does look pretty fun. So, three top choices on tap this week, which will you be enjoying? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that is what's on tap this week. Basically, The Last of Us Part 2 is the biggest entry there. Uh, I hope you're all looking forward to that game as much as I am. Um, As soon as I have no responsibilities, once the Saturday and Sunday days are done you know where you'll be able to find me. But joining me now uh, on the Cheese Steaks and Controllers podcast, the first ever interview of our podcast right here in episode two. And this is one I'm very, very excited about. He is the director of marketing and communications for Arcade One Up, those magnificent arcade cabinets we talked about last week. This is David McIntosh. David, thank you for your time. Hey, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. So uh, we had four big announcements from you guys last week. We had Miss Pac-Man, the big Buck Hunter, X-Men versus Street Fighter, my personal favorite of the four, and the virtual Marvel pinball table. Uh, Which of those four excites you personally the most? You know, you're not supposed to pick favorites when it comes to your children. (laughs) And and, and personally, these are my, my, my kids. I've been working on these projects for the last two years, night and day. Um, they all hold a special place in my heart, but my personal favorite, just for um, you know, accolade wise, is probably Miss Pac-Man. Um, just because it's been two years in the making for us, it's the first time it's been released in an at-home format since you know its original release almost forty years ago. 
So for us, this has just been, it's, it's a piece of arcade history that we're, we're lucky enough to get to work through. So I'm really proud of that project. Yeah, that was definitely uh, one of the sharper, like as soon as I saw that, I was instantly transformed back into the arcades of my youth. It looks just like that old cabinet, that nice blue on the side. It's a really a beautiful looking machine. Uh, definitely a big milestone for you guys. Uh, I'm excited to see that uh, out in the wild. Um, that actually brings up an interesting question. How long from initial pitch or initial idea to announcement do these uh, cabinets usually take? You mentioned two years. Is that abnormally mm-hmm. long or is that about what we're uh, what, what you're dealing with? It really depends on the work that needs to be done. Um, in some cases, there's one license holder. Uh, they hand you the source code. They hand you the artwork. It's very cut and paste. Uh, and that's that's a very uh, rare instance. And that can be turned around in, in some cases in like six months. My, my guys are like my whole team from our creative team to our product development team to our licensing team. In that case, they can work really quick. In the uh, more common event, something like NBA, where the game rights are owned by someone like Midway or the you have to deal with the retired players association through the NBA. And then the NBA gets approval on artwork because it holds their modern intellectual property. There are so many sophisticated hoops you have to jump through in an event like that. In addition to the fact that we actually redeveloped the original source code to have online capabilities when it comes to NBA jam. So that particular project takes about like a year and a half, um, something like Ms. Pac-Man uh, took longer just because our partners, are, you know, we've been great partners with Bandai s- since our launch in 2018 with Pac-Man and Galaga. Mm-hmm. And they were two of our more successful projects. And um, they said, if, it, if you know, when we do release Miss Pac-Man, it has to be done with such attention to detail. And it, it, like they, they wouldn't let us uh, do it uh, unless we were fully prepared. So they just, it, it's been a long process, about two years in the making, but we're really happy it finally gets to see the light of day. And it's one of those projects that we feel we, we really are doing justice. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, mm-hmm. Again, I'm very excited to see that one out in the, uh, out in the stores. Uh, but you mentioned the uh, online capabilities of the NBA Jam cabinet, Wi-Fi in a cabinet, um, pretty big deal when that was announced back at CES this past year, I believe. Uh, mm-hmm. It just recently released, what, last weekend? That's right. Yeah, they just started showing up at people's house. Mine's on its way. I'm so excited. <laughs> All right. There you go. Yeah. Now, how difficult was it to go back into the old code and implement that online technology? And could we see future cabinets use it in the in uh, in uh, upcoming releases? Yeah, definitely. We um, So the challenge was we are by – uh, DNA manufacturers, right? So we make and build arcade machines and we typically take source code and we you know, make some small tweaks, but we're not game developers. We haven't been game developers before. So to have to become game developers in a very short period of time with not a lot of experience, you know, it was a challenge. So we hired and partnered with some of the best software designers in Silicon Valley. And, and we made sure that what we did this, we did it right. And, uh, so we, the whole business has evolved into game development now. A, a lot of our future games will have those capabilities to your question. And uh, we, we really see ourselves in this niche of retro games staying true to the original while adding a modern twist to them. Yeah, I feel like online NBA Jam would have sold a lot of people just hearing those three words together. And then you also have tournament edition and hang time on there as well just to sweeten the deal and all three have wi-fi capability correct correct yeah honestly it's it's one of those things where it's not like there's there's no big learning curve you pick it up you play it and i I played um a prototype with my ceo my my svp of licensing and and i'm a i'm a millennial these guys aren't gamers by by default but when when they played you could just pick it up there's one joystick, two but three buttons, and it's really, really intuitive. Uh, easy to play, hard to master, but that was the uh, the whole beauty of arcade games. And then adding the online twists, if you have it at your house, you're you know by yourself, you can still have that bonding experience or that thrill of playing with somebody uh, through the Wi-Fi. So for us, it was a it was a really 
big leap of faith, but the community has backed us and, and everybody seems to be really excited about it. So we're thrilled about that. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, I remember hearing that for the first time and thinking that if it worked, if you were able to make it work, that that could be a huge boon for the company as a whole to get some of these classic arcade games in the future with online play. Um, mm-hmm. That actually brings me uh, to another question. Uh, so Big Buck Hunter is the first cabinet you're going to offer with guns, like the actual mm-hmm. pullout and um, use the guns on the screen, the light guns. Um, what were the obstacles in getting that taken care of? I imagine with the new technology there, you've never worked before with before. You had similar um, issues, maybe not you're not writing source code, but now you have to mm-hmm. implement these guns into the build. How, uh, how did that work? Yeah. So that was a sophisticated, uh, process. You know, we started off being like, we want to do like gun technology. Those were built on CRT monitors. So that's instantly not going to work. You know, there's modern light guns that use light bar sensors, something similar to like what your, Wii would have, sure. uh, your old Wii, uh, and then, we did a lot of research and one of a lot of our team is uh like they're hardcore gamers so they they did some research they found this guy named uh i can't remember his first name but it's sindin light guns uh and this guy is well known in the retro gaming community for having developed his own light gun technology which works on lcd screens uh in in really like simple yet complicated ways where you program kind of a border into the screen it's hidden you can't see it but the gun communicates with this border. It can detect motion almost seamlessly. So for us, it was the it wasn't the most cost effective solution by far, but it made the most sense uh, as our gateway into this type of uh, light gun technology. And for all the future shooters out there, we invested a significant amount of money. Uh, Scott, in particular, his company, uh, into light gun technology to make sure that it felt like you were at the arcade in an at home experience. That's awesome. So this is a bit of a coming out party for that technology as well. Exactly, um, yeah. That's great. Uh, I had thought, I had wondered about how you were going to make that work. As soon as you said CRT, I was having similar thoughts, but uh, I did not expect to hear brand new tech. That's great. Um, so whoever, anyone who's ever played Big Buck Hunter in a bar, um, there's brand new technology in this machine, so you can bring it to your at-home bar. That's very cool. Uh, But however, Mm -hmm. we talk about the light gun game, this being the first, I'm sorry, Big Buck Hunter being the first light gun game in your portfolio. One Mm -hmm. genre that I noticed going through your um, website that is noticeably missing is arcade racing games. Mm -hmm. Um, Always had a spot in the old school arcades back in the day. Uh, Is this something that you'd like to explore if you're not already exploring it? And what challenges would you see? in implementing those into your portfolio? Yeah, so without giving too much away, sure. we are certainly interested in that category. Um, you know, we understand we've hit every single piece of the uh, portfolio for for arcade games. In, te- in terms of categories, you know, we have the fighters, we have some of the sports now, we have our first shooter, uh, but we are missing the driving games, uh, racing in particular, but... Uh, we're, we're currently looking into a few different projects and the challenges, as you mentioned, is in the three quarter scale form factor, how do you make it work? You know what I mean? So yeah. you go to an arcade, you have this huge uh, seat that just like consumes you when you sit in it. Um, you know, it, it's really, it's hard to capture that experience, which is what we really try to do with our arcade machines. So we're working right now to have an experience that that comes really close to that arcade experience you know and love when you play racing games at an affordable at-home price tag. So that's really been the challenge uh, for us, as well as having something like a responsive steering wheel, uh, you know, shift gear shifters. When we developed the uh, Star Wars flight yoke, that yoke itself took a whole project team months and months and months to get right because when you roll something out that like the a flight yoke itself if you go on kijiji or amazon can cost a thousand to three thousand dollars and we're selling the machine for four hundred dollars so to get a flight yoke that feels like that thousand dollar experience on a three hundred dollar four hundred dollar arcade machine it was it took a lot of uh, engineering and designing 
Uh, so we're doing the same thing right now with our uh, steering wheel technology as well as gear shifters and gas pedals and brakes and stuff to try and make it as, as close to that arcade experience as possible without giving any more away. We're definitely interested in the racing category. Sure. Uh, and do you see, it's just a quick follow-up. And again, if you can't give it away, I'm not trying to get you in trouble. Um, do you see any challenge in, I know back in the day, there were some racing games where you stood up and um, obviously they weren't as intuitive as the sit down racing titles, but um, would you go that route? If you had to, if, if building a whole seat is just too uh, difficult. I mean, in your case, people can provide their own seats if they have to. So as long mm -hmm. as you just provide the pedals, you might be able to get away with um, not having to build the entire encapsulating cabinet. Is that something you've thought about? Yeah, yeah. So if you look at our Star Wars as a prime example, we started off with a stand up version and then we offered a, a sit down, like a seated bench version. Ah, yes. Um so that. if you use that as kind of guidelines for how we found workarounds for, for machines where you typically sit in a whole experience that has like an overarching, uh, you know, headpiece to it, uh, we're looking at solutions like that for some of our driving games. Yeah, just a pull-out bench, it looks like. Uh, yeah, that, that's really cool. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, something like that would work just fine. Uh, not bad. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That, that makes great. I, uh, had, I had looked right at that machine and did not put two and two together. Whew. <laughs> um, yeah yeah so you can imagine something something similar for for uh potential driving games down the road for sure cool that sounds good um so a couple more questions i don't want to take too much more of your time uh no this problem is, for those listening this is david mcintosh the director of marketing and communications for arcade one up talking classic arcade games with me today uh you mentioned earlier you have great partners in bandai namco and capcom with the fighter games but with some of the lesser known IP or the real classic games, people might not know who owns those games anymore. Like Midway, a lot of their assets were bought up by Warner Brothers. So I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that's where NBA Jam had to come from, right? Interesting. Yeah, it's funny you say that because sometimes we don't even know uh, where these games have gone. We had an attorney who worked with Art uh, Atari. We had uh, somebody who worked with Sega. My uh, SVP of licensing came from Capcom. So we, we have a lot of industry experts who have worked with a lot of our, our AAA uh, license holders. But it, at the end of the day, my licensing guy always jokes around and says, I just start with a simple Google search. I read the wiki pages. Some people have already done the research for you. If you're really keen on, on finding out who owns what, you can typically find that out relatively easy online. However, a lot of these uh, acquisitions, mergers, and just straight out sales of companies happened prior to the age of, of like computers and technology where everything was archived online. So some of these things are still a mystery. Some people claim they have rights they don't necessarily actually have the rights to without any paper trail to confirm it. Other people, um, they, they have the paper trail, but it's not digitized. So they have to go through their vault of, of boxes to oh, confirm geez. certain things. It's absolutely hysterical sometimes when we have these conversations. I feel so bad for my licensing guy because he, he, he's like a detective sometimes. Like he, he has to do all that detective work, and uh, it, it's really uh, fascinating to hear those stories. Yeah. Um, I, wow. I, I, you don't really think – because those games are what? Uh, early, mid-'80s, so they're being mm -hmm. a paper trail, but being an actual physical paper trail makes a lot of sense. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, in my research last night, I was looking up uh, a classic shooter title from uh, the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, made by Midway, and I realized, oh, huh, they would have to go through Warner Brothers to get that one if they were to ever pursue it. So it's, it's interesting to see where these IPs have ended up throughout the years. Um, mm -hmm. So my last question for you today is a simple one. Um, are there any arcades out, any arcade games out there that aren't yet a part of the arcade one-up family that you personally, from your days as a gamer, you said you were a millennial, so you've been mm -hmm. playing for a long time, would like to pursue? I'd like to see the company start to hit on some modern games. I know, I know that uh, the hardcore gamers for the retro arcades may not want to hear it, but you go to a Dave and Buster's, or you go to uh, any like barcade near you, and they have some pretty cool modern games set up. You know, like, and if you had that experience in an arcade or an at-home form factor, I just think that'd be a ton of fun, especially for uh, new gamers, old gamers alike. Uh, you go to a barcade with your, your family or your friends and you can still have a, a good time regardless of 
when the game came out. And, you know, you look at games like Golden Tee. I mean, we have the retro version, which is a ton of fun. But when you go to a like there's a bar down the road before, uh, you know, COVID hit that I'd go to all the time and, and they have a modern version of Golden Tee. And it's like you can play online and you can play against other bars and the graphics are phenomenal. And I think it'd be really cool if a company started to tackle some of those modern games, too. I agree with you there. You mentioned Dave and Buster's. If you can get that old horse racing title from Sega, Derby, Over- Derby Owners Club, I think it was called. If you can get that with online capabilities, that that might be one that I would be too tempted to deny. The only problem mm-hmm. is you'd have to come up with some sort of card reader system. And uh, right. I think you have enough, enough on your plate to have to worry about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's, a ch- there's challenges, too, with um, when, you, when you start to charge uh, like money per use – it becomes a coin op, and at that point, in in whatever way you want to call it, if it's not coin, it's card or cash, whatever. Yeah. But um, it becomes like a pay to play machine, which starts to enter commercial grade, and it also, like, a lot of our partners still make arcades for the Dave and Buster's and stuff, so they don't, they may not necessarily want us to enter that category, so we don't cannibalize one another. Oh, that's true. That's a that's mm-hmm. a good thought as well. See, uh, the, you're thinking of things that I would never even consider, and that's why I uh, reached out to you uh, for this interview, and I really do appreciate it. David, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time. It's been very insightful as to the Arcade 1-Up, uh, how you guys work, what kind of ca- the kind of cabinets you put out. Very, very, very much excited for your latest offerings, especially that X-Men vs. Street Fighter cabinet. Um, it's taking everything in me not to pre-order that thing right now. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that one. You got to do it, man. Arcade1up.com. Go hit that subscribe button. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Arcade1up.com. Support them. They do great work. David, thank you so much for your time. And uh, looking forward to everything Arcade1up has in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. All right. There he is, folks. David McIntosh for Arcade1up. An excellent interview with a lot of great insight into that arcade home machine business. Um, The racing portion is most intriguing to me, the fact that they are working on technology to bring racing games home. The racing game was a huge part of the arcade scene back in the day, so the fact that they're even attempting this is awesome. I imagine it is a lot of work, but uh, I trust that they can do it. Uh, I have a vision dancing in my head of a Sega-themed racing cabinet with Crazy Taxi, Sega Rally, and Daytona USA. Tell me that wouldn't be amazing, if only to hear that awesome Daytona in my home whenever I wanted. That would be amazing. But I digress, and I apologize for the crappy singing there. It's time for the speed run. Our first topic on today's speed run is the Penny Arcade Expo, better known as PAX to the gaming crowd. Uh, They're taking a bit of an interesting audible uh, on running two of their events this year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. They were supposed to run two shows, PAX West in Seattle, used to be called PAX Prime, and PAX Aus in Australia, but instead they will merge the two into a nine-day on Line event September 12th to the 20th. Fan favorite content 24 hours a day over nine days, all for free, with some sort of social element that will give players a chance to connect with and make new friends. Now, according to the press release, PAX Online will serve as a digital space encompassing everything fans love about PAX Aus and West's annual bash including surprising game reveals, hands-on demos, thrilling esports tournaments, a carefully curated indie showcase, as well as new partnerships bringing the virtual show floor to life as Reed Pop and Penny Arcade translate their vision into an accessible new online format. The first thing I can think of is power to you folks, because that is a Herculean undertaking that I do not envy you for having to make. Um... If you can bring the PAX experience online for nine days with nine reveals and nine demos and nine days of three... Not nine reveals and nine demos. Nine days of reveals and nine days of demos. Nine reveals would be pretty underwhelming. Whoopsie. Uh, Nine days of esports tournaments. Maybe get some fighting games in there because there's not enough fighting game tournaments right now. 
this could be really, really cool. PAX East, a couple of times I have gone, has always been a highlight up in Boston. That show is awesome. I've been twice in 2010 and 2013. I would love to get back there um, because that city is amazing. The convention center is awesome. The show they put on, the convention they put on is, is terrific. It's a very good mix of indie and AAA games, whereas E3 tends to lean on the uh, AAA, the heavy hitters. Um, that is a very good place to find a game that you would never expect. Uh, and if we're going to get that for nine days online, I am all about this. Now, they are accepting panels, uh, panel submissions, uh, people who are looking for uh, cool panels to talk about with people to, I guess, sit in on Zoom or however they're going to broadcast them, maybe WebEx or something like that. Um, I am openly volunteering for any panels that anybody wants to run. I'm trying to think of any ideas that I have for myself. That would be very cool. Um, but, I mean, you guys put up with me for an hour right here on this podcast. Uh, maybe that's what I'll do. Maybe I'll just I'll record a podcast for the PAX online crowd. Whoever wants to join Cheese Steaks and Controllers Live, I'm all about that life. Uh, we'll get some guests in there, we'll, we'll talk about cool games, we'll talk about esports, we'll talk about it all. I'll bring a little Philly to Boston, and uh, hey, if I can get a budget, maybe I'll bring some cheesesteaks too. But nah, Boston would be later in the year. This particular online one, um, it's a very cool idea, and I really like that these game companies or event holders are going out of their way to try to bring the same experience to the home in this current very strange situation. Um, it's never going to be fully replicated. You're not going to be able to recreate the feeling of going to a convention in person. But the attempts are excellent. Like the quote uh, from Jerry Holkins, co-founder of PAX, in the press release says, PAX Online brings that shared experience home, along with game reveals, hands-on experiences, the chance to hear from and speak with your favorite game developers, plus so much more. Even if we can't all meet in Seattle or Melbourne this year, we look forward to reconnecting with our friends and welcoming everyone to our new home, PAX Online. Technically, you're already there. That's marvelous, and I hope this works out for them. I truly, truly do. Looking forward to PAX Online this year. Now, moving on from that, uh, earlier tonight, uh, recording this Thursday the 18th, EA laid out their plans for the rest of the year and early 2021 in the EA Play Live 2020 presentation. And the best I can say about it is... Yeah? I mean, it wasn't terrible. I have seen terrible shows before. This had a good mix of updates on current games, brand new games, very exciting gameplay for a particular game, and a huge reveal at the end, but there were some noticeable absences. Uh, in particular, uh, the Mass Effect remaster that I have been salivating for was nowhere to be found. Uh, no Bioware news at all, to be honest with you. I went heavy in my bio, in my prediction with Sean Brace with Bioware, Mass Effect, Dragon Age, Anthem. None of them showed up. Instead, we got... A lot of different announcements revolving uh, the Switch. EA is finally coming to support the Switch with Apex Legends and a couple other games coming soon. The Sims 4 on Steam. Another big thing for EA is that they're joining Steam's uh, online marketplace with the Sims 4 and Battlefield. The Battlefield series is already there. Mass Effect's already there. Uh, the fact that they're kind of easing their support of Origin and moving towards Steam is very interesting and I feel like a long time coming. So that's cool. Uh, a couple of indie announcements in It Takes Two, the most recent game, or the new game, from the man who made Brothers and A Way Out. That's uh, Joseph Farris and Hazelight. Uh, Lost in Random, a very a very new, very interesting looking game from, an, from a studio called Zoik in Sweden. And then Rocket Arena, which looks like a really fun arena th uh, multiplayer shooter where everybody has rockets. Uh, it could be rockets in a pistol, it could be rockets in a giant chain gun, but everybody's got rockets, not bullets, and you're just blowing each other up uh, in a, a nice cartoonish setting. No uh, heavy blood, no heavy gore, anything like that. Just rocket-based fun. I'm in on that. That looks pretty interesting. Uh, rounded out with uh, a huge blowout of gameplay on Star Wars Squadrons, the 
dog fighting game set in the Star Wars universe coming out soon. The the, the uh, X Wing and the Tie Fighters zipping through space, shooting each other. Uh, the fact that these games are going to be completely in ER make uh, ER ER VR makes me very happy because it looks like it's perfect for my PlayStation VR that's been sitting collecting dust for a little while. I really got to get back into that. Um, that's the one that's definitely on my radar for this year. Uh, we saw a montage of Madden 21 and FIFA 21. First time we have seen FIFA, and they look like better versions of the sports games we have come to expect. And then finally, the big announcement at the end was the return of the Skate franchise. Now, Skate 3 released, I believe, in 2010, 2011, and fans have been clamoring for a new Skate game ever since, and EA is finally pulling the trigger, finally, I'm assuming, convinced by the Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 remaster, uh, Skater XL, and a couple other skateboard games that are emerging in the absence of that genre. So Skate is Skate 4, or whatever that game's going to be called, is going to jump in there too. They didn't show any gameplay. They only showed two guys on the team talking about it. But the fact that it exists is very exciting. I've seen a lot of reaction to this show on Twitter about how it was underwhelming, it didn't have enough, and I can see your point. But you figure they announced... Star Wars Squadron's gameplay for the first time, which looked excellent. They announced three new indie titles, which is impressive. And for me, the most important announcements in this series, in this uh, presentation, was the support for Switch and the support for Steam. Origin has been long maligned as a launcher that is buggy and unnecessary, and now EA is finally wising up to it and supporting Steam, which is wild in its own right. But the fact that they are finally coming around on the Nintendo Switch, which they have said, we're still waiting, we're still waiting to see how successful it is, we're still waiting, even after it sold tens of millions of consoles, EA is finally getting off their backside and supporting this system. Will it be too little too late? I don't know. But the fact that they're actually putting games on the Switch now, some ports, some brand new titles, I hope, really shows the power of this console. If they are able to convince EA, who has been burned by Nintendo before, the Wii is a big example. Uh, the fact that they are coming around to the Switch is awesome. I can't wait to play EA titles on the Switch, on the go. I hope the sports titles are included in that. Uh, I'm not sure if they will be this year, just because the downgrade between Series X and PS5 and Switch is probably more significant than I really realize. But that is um, it's great news for the Switch that EA is finally jumping on board this thing. And I think it's an announcement that's really going on under the radar uh, for people that are reacting to this EA Play presentation. Um, so there, there you go. That is the speed run for this week. couple of big events, one in the past, one in the future. Um, there is still plenty more happening in the world of gaming and our... Big summer gaming event list on foxphlgambler.com's blog, updating every week with new entries and deleting old entries, so the top of the list will always be the closest upcoming event. Easy for you to follow, easy for me to follow, uh, definitely look for that as a resource. If your favorite company has something coming up, that would be the place to look to see when it is. Um... And then there are other blog entries coming up soon. I'm going to write one on Nintendo. I have a couple other ideas in the pipeline that I would love to share with you in the near future. But for now, it is time to say goodbye to Episode 2 of the Cheese Steaks and Controllers podcast. As I said last week, if you are listening to these words at the end of the show, I cannot thank you enough for your support and your time and your ears that you are willing to spend this time with me just sitting around and talking about video games for a little while. It truly means the world to me that you trust me enough to listen to me for an hour a week. Um, I hope that it brings you some joy. I hope that it informs you. And I hope that one day I'll be recording this for a room full of people at a PAX East cheese steaks and controllers live and we all just sit around and have a good time playing talking about video games and esports um this is the end 
of episode two of the Cheese Steaks and Controller podcast. Again, thank you so, so much for your listening and your support and your time. I hope to continue to impress you in the future. Talk to you again next week. See you later.